I need to change that. How do I change my name? Let me use
Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, so for Ms. Gardner, she wants me to see her four hours. Okay. Is so, that like correct or like? She has, I don't know how many hours she has. What does she have for you to do for four hours? I don't know. She just said on um, Wednesday, next, that's next week. She said she, said she oh. this week. So this next week. She said we can do like 9.30, like 1. Okay, listen, I'm going into a Zoom class with, with my biology teacher. So can I call you when I'm done? I'm sorry, you can cut it out. Okay, I'm going into my Zoom class. Can I call you? Okay. All right. Bye. This piece of hair, I've seen it, and it's there it goes. Okay. Whew. Whoever's on there as Zoom user, I did send you a chat to tell you how to rename yourself. We got a little bit of time before we're going to start. I say a little bit of time, but um, can you guys hear me? It's not. Okay. Um, sorry. It's not giving me that little symbol of the green. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's just sitting there. So I just want to be sure that you guys could hear. All right. Um, yeah, we're going to, we have just a couple minutes. I'm going to try to give people an opportunity to log on. Um, so we're just getting set up. So if you guys have any questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Professor, Yos, I wasn't able to get the top hat. I don't know if oh. I need to maybe like opt out and just buy it. But the books said don't, don't buy it because it came with Yeah, I got a lot of emails. I've gotten a lot of emails and a lot of comments about this. Um, we actually talked about this yesterday. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I said that it was, you need to wait it out and you can fix it, I meant that it was going to take like, it could take a couple of minutes. It's not going to take 10 minutes or something. So, um, yeah. And I will let you know when it's fixed. You guys just, if it's not working, it's just not working. Like, that's it. Like, I've emailed them three or four times and they haven't gotten back to me in any way, shape, or form. And there's nothing I can do. Um, don't uh, buy anything if you guys are like, oh, well, I got to turn this assignment in. Like, Professor Yo says it's due. Better turn it in. I don't want a zero. Like, that's not how this is going to work. I'm not a dick like that. <laughs> so, uh, so, like, I'm aware of the situation. So, no worries with that. If it isn't up by the time that your assignment due is due, Probably like I'm really hoping that we can fix it by then. Um, probably we will just um, either have you guys do like a temporary. There's like a sign free sign up, like a guest sign up or something like that, or trial. That's what it is, the free trial. Um, okay. I might have you guys do that, or um, we might just not do it until we're back in the lab. You know, because it's not a big deal until we get back in the lab, anyways. I'm gonna be honest. So okay. yeah. Um, don't worry about it too much. I, I'll keep you guys posted. I mean, I know I've emailed Top Hat and I know that um, Robin in the bookstore has emailed Top Hat mm -hmm. twice. And I, um, so I emailed Top Hat yesterday and I emailed them today. Um, it's just a matter of when they're going to get back. You know how it is. It's just like uh, customer service. BS. Uh, and I know so many of you guys have too. 
Um, I don't know at this point whether or not this is an issue on their end or if this is an issue on something I didn't set up correctly, but I can't know. If right. They don't tell me. <laughs> so right. that's what we're waiting on. Um, it might be like a user interface thing or I have no close the door. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I know this this a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. The ass, and I'm not gonna lie, it was a pain in the last ass last um, semester. But since oh, semester, so I typically don't change a lot of stuff for the summer just because it's a lot of work to change something um, for you know an eight week course, and I'm having to change having to, uh, for a new textbook for the fall. So it's like change the course and then change the course again or leave it the same. And so you guys got stuck right. with leave it the same. So you still have to use Top Hat and probably not. I'm not gonna use it again after this semester because of this crap. So. Sorry. <laughs> it sucks for me. Um, it sucks for you. Uh, we will use it like the lab manual. Once we get it going, it's actually useful. It's just a matter of getting to that. And that tends to be a problem. Or like today, I tried to get on there to like check it out to see like if I could figure out anything more about what's going on. And um, I got on there and it was like uh, not loading. And it was like, cannot, can't load top hat, top hats offline. And I'm like, oh my God. It's like, what else is it going to be? So I apologize for all of that, but hopefully we will get it fixed um, before we have to be in lab when when it'll be Get it to work, and um, we'll either do that free trial or we will do um, what else was I going to say? Uh, maybe um, just work from our worksheets and just the stuff that I'm going to test you guys on is the stuff on our worksheets, anyways. So hopefully that's all we'll need um, if we can't get this to work. So I'm taking you guys' role. I've got Kristen. I've got Destiny. I've got Eshwarya. Marissa. I start to click through each of these. Erica. Erica. I know it's in alphabetical order, but for some reason I can't find it right. Um, Lillian and Nick. There's no satellite stuff, so Rocky. And then I get some light in the dark. On that Jenna night, and Donna. We've got Emma and Jack. I'll bring the dignity. <laughs> so we're missing Katie and Nadia and Sarah. I think Nadia joined us a little later last time. We'll see. But yeah. So, um, so I got attendance. I'll check again at the end, just to be sure. It, um, I'm not super picky, by the way, about people being on time for things. Like I expect you to try to attend as much of this, this as you can or the lab, you know. Um, but if you come in 10 minutes late because of traffic or something like that, I'm not going to like be like, get out of the lab or whatever. So um, <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, just try to be there uh, with within reason, you know? So if you come in a little late, just be sure you let me know so I can um, mark you down as having been there on the attendance because the attendance is what I am using when I go back and say, this person has missed five classes. They, you know, we can't let them miss anymore. So, um, so yeah, be sure. You let me know if you come in a little late, um, whether it's on Zoom or in person. All right. So, uh, obviously, the way my policy with that is, if you do come in late, um, that you guys realize that you have only what's left of the class period to get the work done, right? So it's reasonable. Um, if you come in a little late to the lab, then you have the rest of the lab to get that lab done with your table mates. It's usually not an issue at all, so wouldn't really worry about it, but it's the same policy for exams. So if you come in 30 minutes late to the exam and, you know, it's an hour and 15 minute course, you know, technically to take the exam, then you have what's left of that period to take the exam. And that's it. Unless you have like an absolute documented reason that we can discuss about why you were late. Like, um, I don't know. I don't even know what, if you were showing up late, you shouldn't be sick. Right. So I don't know what it would be, but um, maybe your kid was sick or something like that. If you can document it and prove it to me so that I have a paper trail to follow so that I'm not getting accused of special treatment. That's what this is kind of about. Um, but yeah, if you can document why, then we can talk about it. But if otherwise, if you're just running late, most people don't take the whole time to take the exams anyways. They're usually done in like 20 minutes. So don't stress about it. But that's the policy. 
Um, so we're going to get started today talking about lab safety. Yeah, it's a pretty good time to start. Lab safety and ubiquity of microbes. Ubiquity, if you don't know that's what that word means, it's okay. That word just means it's everywhere. They're all over. Um, most of us are kind of aware that, you know, bacteria and everything are kind of everywhere. You know, you touch your keyboard or you, you know, you're playing with, you know, a fidget spinner or some other distraction device or whatever it is, um, that that's gross, right? <laughs> There's bacteria on it. And we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the value behind that or the worth behind that as we start learning about diseases and how they're transmitted and everything like that. But just to start with, we're going to just talk about how they are everywhere and where they could be um, and what kind of microbes you might find in those locations. Um, so that'll be the second part of this talk. But there should be some um, videos in here. I hope that they open up okay. I, I made this PowerPoint at home. So sometimes the like firewall or whatever of OSU because I'm on campus today. Um, hopefully it doesn't block it. So we'll see, but yeah. Um, okay, let's start with lab safety. There is a lab safety document that you are required to open on um, Canvas in that first up module in the modules section. Um, you can't access anything without doing those things, right? So this is one of them. You have to open this document. Does that mean you had to actually read it when you opened it? Of course not. But be sure before we get in person into lab, definitely before then, um, that you're familiar with it and the rules that are on it. We're going to go through the rules and especially the major ones, um, you know, kind of individually, but I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but do be familiar with it. All right. Uh, well, let's talk about the gist of the rules. So when you come to lab in person, 100%, you have to have a lab coat. I don't care what color it is. Um, white is just better because you can see if there's stuff on it a little bit easier um, and they're easier to find. That's why white is better. So yeah, um, white is great. Any color will work as long as you treat it as a lab coat. It has to be flame retardant. Almost all of them are. So as long as it's a lab coat, you should be safe. Um, and then closed toed shoes are required in the summer. I must never wear closed toed shoes except for, you know, when I'm at work and then I always do. Um, this is just for your own safety. If you drop a, a tube and they're little, just little test tubes, you know, if you drop them on the ground, they'll shatter. You don't want to get glass in your shoe and cut your foot. And we're working with live bacteria. Like I said, um, you don't want to risk it, even though they're non-pathogenic. So non-disease causing you want to protect yourself as much as possible. Crocs are not closed toe. I say that because I have so many students um, show up with Crocs on and they're just not thinking about it because that's what they wear. And they're like, oh yeah, it's cover covers your foot. Yeah, but the liquid can still get in there. So please don't do that. If you have to bring an extra pair of like tennis shoes in your car, then just do that, man. So um, if you come into class and you do not have closed toed shoes on and you just like forgot, you have the time to go get closed toed shoes, whether that means borrowing some friends <laughs> the same size as you or go to Walmart and buy some or go home and grab some. I don't care, but you know, yeah, that's go do it and then come back and join us when you can. I won't kick you out permanently as long as you do show up and do your work. Um, but yeah, do, do have a lab coat and closed toed shoes. Those are required. And if you don't have them, I will not allow you into the lab. And then you have to go get those things, right? Don't come back until you have them. Um, so that's for your safety. So yeah, those two things, the lab coat and the closed toe shoes, those are the requirements. We don't need goggles and you don't have to have gloves. Um, I recommend gloves. If you have gloves, bring them. Um, don't bend over backwards buying gloves for this course. It's not really necessary. Just be sure you wash your hands and all that. So yeah, we won't have gloves. I don't wear gloves for the course either. It makes you feel any better so. Um, but yeah, come to lab with those things. Um, you will this, so the lab safety portion of the course is something that can qualify for testing over in the exams. So on the lab midterm, there will be at least one question, if not two questions about lab safety, like we're going over right now. And, um, sometimes there won't be a question so much as if we get to the midterm and you don't have your lab coat for the midterm, then you get marked off points. So be aware of that. Um, so it's part of it being familiar with the lab safety stuff. Um, yeah, includes yeah, your pre-labs are supposed to like 
the pre-labs that we can't access are supposed to prepare you for the knowledge of kind of what you're getting ready to face. So you're not going in there completely blind and that helps keep you safe because you have an idea of what to expect. We don't have the pre-labs. So um, if you guys want to uh, read up, because we're going to be going over the first actual lab um, exercise on Wednesday, what well, something we would have been doing stuff in the lab in person, right? So it would have been Wednesday and Thursday, and then from here on out. But um, we don't have Top Hat with access to the pre-lab. So what you can access are the worksheets that we use in the lab. The ones that I have told you, they'll go in the little um, dryer, like the clear envelope thing, and we write on them with dry erase. So on the front of those, there's this whole long BS about um, what we're doing that day. And then follows up with the actual um, steps. And then on the back are the questions that you would go through, take a picture of it, and post it as evidence on Top Hat for completion. We don't have access to Top Hat. So these worksheets are available on Canvas. Um, I don't remember what they're called. It's in the modules area. I'm looking at it. I'm looking it up right now. It's just slow. If you scroll to the bottom of the modules area in the lab documents and worksheets, we have microbiology lab safety is the first thing on there. That's the lab safety document we just saw. And then we have right below that in lab participation worksheets. And if you open that up, it has all of the worksheets for every single lab that we're going to be doing. So just read the one that's appropriate for that day. So if you were to open it up, let me show you it. Oh yeah, it's gonna do it like this. Let's see. But you'll get the idea of it. You don't need to read it right now or anything, but this is it just open in the browser for now. Um, but in lab participation worksheets, and then um this whole top portion is explaining to you basics of what is um, what we're doing in that lab. So we'll be going over this in our um online virtual version of that. So it'll make this part easier. Um, in the in-person labs, we're actually doing hands-on labs. We don't spend as much time on that stuff simply because it's, I want you guys to have time to do the hands-on portion. Um, that part's better for learning typically, but we don't have hands-on. So um, so I go into a little bit more depth of in, the explanation um, and some examples and videos and things like that. So Hopefully that'll be helpful, but that top part contains bas the basic info for what you could be tested on um, with regard to that particular lab. So that's lab number one, and we have followed by uh, the procedure for the exact lab we would have been doing. And then this is the second page of it, um, the questions associated with it, and we'll do these tomorrow whenever we do all this. I'll walk you through it again, but that's what you will be looking at. So if you want to prepare beforehand, open this up, the lab participation worksheets, and um, give that a gander and see if you can figure that out. Um, but yeah, so that's where you can start until we can get on to Top Hat, and then it'll have more um, pictures and, and things that go along with it. But these are just meant to be two page, easy to use in the lab type of things. Um, and then it just goes on to exercise two and then so on and so forth for all the exercises that we have. They're all two pages. Um, they're all laid out the same way. Top part, explanation, stuff in the orange box, the procedure itself, step-by-step step, that you could follow in the lab. In the back of it, we'll have questions, usually three questions about what you were doing in the lab and then something dealing with the grand rounds, which we'll go over tomorrow. We don't need to worry about that right now. Um, but yeah, since we don't have pre-labs, you know, that's your uh, other option. Okay. All right, that's good. I'm happy with that. All right. When you do come into lab for your personal items and your uh, drinks or your snacks, I know a lot of people are walking around with like um, drink cups. I usually, you can find me with two of them. I have like my like iced tea that I make um, and I don't drink it sweet. People think I'm weird for that. It's just tea, <laughs> like tea bags, chill it in some ice water, but that's how I like it. And then I have my coffee. Um, so if you're walking around with two of them, like I am, it doesn't matter. You still got to leave them outside of the lab. Those, um, or if you conceal them properly, like, uh, this one, the one with the big straw in it or whatever, I can take the straw out and actually like seal it up so that it's wa watertight, put that in your backpack and you can bring that into lab like that. Just don't be getting it out and taking sips. That's gross. 
um, legit, this is a gross place to be. So in the lab is a gross place to be. Um, we're dealing with bacteria. Yes, it really is um, E. coli and salmonella and staph and stuff like that. It is non-pathogenic, but we can't always control bacteria. So, um, and you'll learn about their genetics and everything, but they can pick up and drop off genes um, and just become antibiotic resistant and just become um, pathogenic because they got this other gene that makes a toxin or whatever. So even on lab strains are susceptible to becoming pathogenic that way by being exposed to maybe the strains that you carry naturally on your body. So um, just let's not mess with it. Just keep your drinks and your food outside of the lab gross, okay? Um, that's just the, the end of that. Yeah, um, but where the lab is, if you guys don't know, if you've been to physiology, then you probably know where the micro lab is. It's just the next door down. And then at the end of the hall is the physics lab. It's not gonna be physics anymore. They're changing it to biomanufacturing. Um, and they're gonna be doing a lot of construction on that, which is, Part of the reason why this is all a nightmare, but they're just throwing us out the window and whatever. Maybe that's fine for you guys because we can do it this way and um and whatever. But um it is what it is. So when we do finally get into the micro lab, if and when we get into the micro lab, um, don't bring your food and drinks in there because it's gross because we literally have bacteria growing. Um, people spill that stuff all the time, and you will probably spill that stuff too. And you don't want to get it in your drinks. You don't want to get in your shoes. It's just nasty. Okay. Um, oral transmission and wounds. Right. Don't be touching. Don't be chewing on your pen or putting it in your mouth. I have a real, I'm fidgety. Obviously, I'm a fidgety person. I'm all over the place. I'm super scatterbrained. Um, and so I always have a fidget. Yeah. So, um, so I'm super fidgety and... Um, yeah, yeah. If I touch this and I like, then you know, put it in my mouth. I don't know why I would put it in my mouth, but maybe you're that person. Um, just don't in the lab because the pens that you're working with, other people have touched, and or bacteria may have gotten on them or whatever. It's just gross. So don't do mouth stuff <laughs> when you're in the lab. You know what I'm saying, right? Um, because keep it, just keep your hands out of your mouth, definitely out of your eyes. Um, it's just like you know how they say it's super easy to get pink eye. Well, pink eye, a lot of the times, pink eye is transmitted uh, due to maybe viruses. That's probably the most common way if you have like clear um, liquid in your pink eye. But if it's not clear, if it's yellowy or white like, or milky, um, that's bacterial and it's almost always going to be fecal bacteria. So yeah, they're all over the place because people just don't wash their hands appropriately. So when we're dealing with those bacteria literally, um, directly, then you uh, want to be sure that you're not putting those in your mouth or in your eye or whatever it is, or your piercings or your tattoos or whatever it is. Um, so be just be aware. Okay. Um, so pens. So anytime that you have like a pen um, or like a fidget spinner or whatever it is in there, let's say that you have COVID, right? Or I have COVID. Um, and I have been using this pen and I put it in my mouth cause I'm like thinking or like, um, typing on my keyboard and I cough or I sneezed and it's my keyboard, like who cares? But then somebody comes in here to, um, borrow it for some reason, and I, or I went home sick and I asked them to look something up for me on my computer. Um, and then they touched my keyboard or my pen and now they got COVID, right? We can imagine that normal situation. Normally a pen is, doesn't itself have anything infectious on it, right? It doesn't have any viruses or anything on it normally by itself, but uh, you're putting it in your mouth. The saliva puts the virus there. This becomes a vehicle for transmission. When that happens, this is called a fomite. That's the term for that, okay? I might not test you on that on the lab test, but you will see that on the lecture exam. So we can cross over. Um, I find repetition helps the most with learning some of these concepts. So you'll just see, hear me saying some of this stuff over and over again. You'll get bored of it eventually, but that's a good thing because that means you probably learned it. Um, clean environment. When you get into the lab, we will clean our bench top with disinfectant. Um, and then when you leave the lab, when you're done, you will clean it again. Just assume that it got contaminated, that it was contaminated from the people before you. Just assume they didn't clean up after themselves. Um, that it, it got contaminated while you were doing your experiments and you just didn't see it there. Clean it up so the next people don't get in it. And they're going to assume you made a mess. 
and they're going to clean it up too. That's fine. Cleaning it up at the beginning and the end of lab, it'll just prevent um, any contamination that could endanger you or get your samples contaminated with stuff you don't want it in there. So, um, yes. Yeah. Keep everything cleaner than you found it, uh, for sure. If the best you can anyways, right. Um, you know, this is housekeeping stuff. We have a bunch of bottles of disinfectant in red bottles. And then we have a bunch of like kind of clear bottles of water. It's, um, deionized water. So it's a special specific water that we use for our stains. A lot of our stains depend on charges of the cells in order, like the surface of cells would have a negative charge. So um, that charge difference between the negative surface of the cells and whatever your stain is, if it's a positive charge or a negative charge, that helps the stain work. So if you have too many ions that have charges in the water, that affects the stain's ability to do its job. So we use deionized water so it doesn't interfere. So we have to have bottles of that on um, the station. And if your bottles are running low of disinfectant or deionized water, I expect you guys to fill them up. Um, please, <laughs> please fill them up. So I'll show you when we get in lab where you can worry about that. But um, just saying it now, cause I know I'm gonna say it a lot, um, but yes, so. Uh, the dry erase markers that we'll be using, the little envelopes, the plastic clear envelopes that the, the, the papers go in that I'll change out for each lab. Um, it doesn't hurt to clear, you know, clean those with disinfectant. There's no rule about it, about it. If I see that people aren't cleaning those, it's not like you're going to get in trouble, but I'm just letting you know, if you don't clean them, then probably nobody else is going to clean them. And so they're probably going to get dirtier. And it's the same envelope that you're touching in the same dry erase marker every single time that you come into lab. So you might want to clean them. I'm just saying. All righty. Um, in our laboratory, we use Bunsen burners pretty much every single day. I can't, I, I'm not sure. There might be one lab where we don't use them. Um, right now it's hot in this building, y'all. Like it's really hot. And so Bunsen burners are going to make it really hot in the lab. It, it goes like quick how fast it can get hot in there. And I'm just warning you. And you're going to be wearing lab coats too. Um, so kind of be prepared for that sort of a thing, but, um, as far as comfort goes, but we'll survive that. Right. As far as the actual fire itself, we do have fire extinguishers. I'm not going to bother telling you where they are now. You'll see them when we get into the lab. They're kind of obvious near, um, the door and stuff like that. So, um, I'll point them out again when we get into the lab, but we do have fire extinguishers. So I'd be aware of that. Um, there's also an emergency gas shut off by the door. So if somebody's gas is like getting out of control or you can't get it to turn off or it's ca causing another one to catch fire and you're trying to do something or somebody's hair caught on fire and the gas is just getting, I don't know what, but that emergency shut off that I've never had to touch. And I hope I never do is by the door that you come in, There's only one door. So by the door, um, just hit the button and it shuts off everybody's gas all at once. So you don't have to worry about how, where, when, and if you're freaking out, just red button. So <laughs> it turns it all off. Um, if you have long hair, um, like my hair is like medium length, I would say, I don't know. Um, you know, even then you're going to lean. And if you're somebody that wears your hair down, which I almost exclusively wear my hair down and you think it's going to fall forward much, then just wear a hair tie when you're working with the Bunsen burner. Um, if you have longer hair than that, then probably just tuck it into your lab coat if you don't have a hair tie with you. But, you know, I would just say put it back in hair tie before you get started in lab so it doesn't fall into the Bunsen burners. That's actually not uncommon for people's hair to catch on fire. I'm not kidding. So um, keep your hair back. And if I see that it's becoming an issue, then I will remind you about keeping your hair back. Yeah, that's all there is to it. Um, that's so that's one of the rules you want to follow. Uh, if you don't know how to operate the Bunsen burner, don't just, you know, mess around with it until you can get it to work. Ask. Um, or if your table mate is confident in it, yeah, they can tell. I don't mind if you guys know how to do the thing to help your table mates. That's fine. But if you don't, neither of you do and you don't want to ask maybe your other, you know, uh, buddies in class or you just want to ask the prof professor because I know, then fine. Ask me and I'll come over and show you how to do anything, which is a good kind of um segue into this concept that I have and um, 
And uh, so I just, this last one, let's kick it out of the way because it's going to bother me because I'm one of those people. But um, never operate microscopes if there's a Bunsen burner. Okay, that should be obvious. We've got cords going, extension cords, plugging in all over the place. We've got fire also on top of that. Now you're going to be burning extension cords and the microscopes are quite expensive. So we don't want to be ruining that. So do not ever have your microscopes out using them um, while you have your Bunsen burners going. And we use microscopes every single day um, starting with lab number two, um, the actual lab exercise number two. And, um, well, we're not going to this time, but yeah, we would have. Um, so we use a lot of microscopes. You'll be very familiar with the microscope. If you thought you knew how to use a microscope, this lab's going to show you, you did not know how to use a microscope. Um, I'm not kidding with that. Uh, yeah. You'll be asking for help and that is fine. That is fine. That's what I'm there for. I'm there to help you please ask for help. So back to that segue, ask for help. I know I've said it before, but genuinely, especially in the lab, ask for help. Um, if you aren't, don't know what you're doing and you're sitting there and I watch, believe me, I watch. You might not think I'm watching, but I'm watching and I'm usually listening to just FYI. So if you got the tea and it's about me, maybe don't do, <laughs> talk about that stuff in class. People are pretty ballsy sometimes. Um, not that I'm going to necessarily call you out to your face, but you know, maybe don't do that. Um, anyways, I listen and I watch even when you guys think I'm not, even when I'm being scatterbrained. So um, if I see that you are at your bench and maybe your uh, table mates aren't helping you out and you're just sitting there and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you look like you're drowning, you have that deer caught in the headlights look on your face and you don't know what to do, I will let you drown. I will let you drown. Why? It's not a dick move. I promise you it's not. I promise, because most of you guys are going to nursing school after this. And if you don't know what to do with your patient and you're just going to stand there and you're too scared to go ask the charge nurse for help or something, ooh, honey, you should not be a nurse. So if you can't ask me for help in lab where I'm telling you, please ask for help. And you guys will get pretty comfortable with me because I'm pretty chill. But yeah, yeah, get over it. Like it's, this is the time. Um, I will let you drown. So it seems mean, and maybe it is, but this isn't the place to just hope that somebody will hold your hand through it. This is the place that you pick yourself up and start doing the work. So um, in my lab, I will let you drown. If other people have let you um, get by with that, sorry. So, um, and you guys, it's not everybody, right? It's actually very rare that that's an issue. I'm just saying it. Um, if you are one of those people, heads up, okay? Um, and I know that most of you know the type of people I'm talking about. All right. Um, disposing of your materials. And we'll go over it again when we get in the lab. But this is the day for this. So we're doing it. Um, sharps go into the sharps container. And what is a sharps? Well, anything that has a sharp edge. If you were to put it into a grocery bag uh, from Walmart, just a plastic bag, um, and get a whole bunch of that thing and pile it into that bag and hold it closed tight where there's not a whole lot of extra air in there, right? Just like spin it down and you have all of your thing, your glass slides, let's say. If there's a danger of that object cutting out um, to free itself from that bag, put it in the sharps container, basically, okay? So glass slides, even if they're intact, even if they're whole, they've got sharp edges. So we put them in the sharps container. We're making a lot of slides in our class. I don't give you pre-made slides, you make your own. That's part of this whole process. So um, yeah, you're going to um, need to put those when you're done into the sharps container. Um, broken glass obviously also goes into the sharps container. You drop a test tube and it shatters then the glass portion of it will go into the sharps container um, or any beakers we might be using, whatever. So that's, if it's sharp, sharp, if it could poke through plastic or poke through skin, then it goes into the sharps container, okay? Um, this is because we can't just put it into our bag, our plastic bag of biohazard materials because they could just cut their little way out and we have biohazardous materials potentially leaking out of that bag. So no, uh, sharps into the biohazard trash. Sharps always go into the sharps container. So disposables that are not sharps are going to go into the biohazard waste bin. It's just a plastic bin. It's red and it has an orange back. The ones we use are orange. 
Um, and you just pile it in there. You don't have to worry about what happens to it afterwards. We'll take care of that. It's going to go to the autoclave. We'll talk about autoclaves later. But <clears throat> it'll get sterilized before uh, we throw it out. Um, this includes any Petri dishes. Petri dishes, the round ones, excuse me, the round ones with the lids that go on them. They're made of plastic. They're disposable. Okay. Um, so if it has any bacteria and it's like made of plastic and is disposable and it's not something we're going to reuse, um, then it goes into the bio trash. Now, if you like got a Petri dish and um, you wanted to uh, put your bacteria on it and you accidentally dropped the lid and it like marred up the actual auger, the surface where the bacteria would grow. And you're like, oh, this one isn't going to work. Technically that could just go in the regular trash because you didn't grow any bacteria. Okay. So bacteria on a disposable thing, it'll go in the bio trash. Um, plastic pipettes that we use to trans transfer um, liquid bacteria, um, that's going to go in the bio trash. They're we shouldn't be allowed to be near things. Okay. All right, test tubes. The tubes themselves, if they're not broken, right? So we said the broken test tubes, we're not going to reuse those, obviously. They're going to go in the sharps container. If you are done with your test tube, but you didn't break it, we can reuse them. We'll um, wash them and autoclave them and all this stuff to allow us to reuse them. But um, in order for us to clean them properly, to reuse them, you have to take the tape on the outside of them off. Yes, I understand that our lab coordinator could do that. He could take the tape off of the outside of your tubes for you, but let's not be spoiled. You um, are you know, being asked to take your tape off of your tube before you put it over to be cleaned and everything, um, autoclaved. We have a cart for autoclaving things. I'll show you all that when we get there, but um, it's just where we're going to put racks. You can put your tube take your tube off, tape off, put the tube in there, and then eventually we'll autoclave that. Um, it's not your responsibility. That's my lab coordinator's responsibility. Um, but that's where that step will go. An autoclave, that is a machine that uses heat, steam, and pressure to sterilize things. And sterile means that it has absolutely no living thing on it whatsoever at all in any way. Um, some things are pretty resistant to being killed. They have what we call endospores. Those are protective structures that some bacteria make, um, but those endospores um, can be resistant to things like boiling. Boiling doesn't sterilize. So that's why we go with the autoclave. It even kills those. So that's the whole idea there. And we'll learn all about that. I'm sure you're super excited. Um, regular trash can, if you are coming into lab, you start the lab, you squirt your disinfectant on your countertop and you wipe it down with a paper towel. That paper towel can go in the trash, regular trash, plain old trash. You didn't put a bacterial sample and wipe it up on it. Um, it's just regular disinfectant in a paper towel. Could there be tiny amounts of bacteria? Of course, but tiny amounts of bacteria are everywhere. So tsh, don't worry about it. If you know that you spilled bacteria and there's pools of it there, yeah, if you wipe it up then, put it in the bio trash, please. Um, but yeah, so paper towels that you dry your hands with, paper towels that you wiped your surface of your bench with, with the disinfectant. Um, Pipettes that you use for reagents, but didn't touch cultures. Um, disposable pipettes that we use for pond water. It's just pond water. Most of the time people touch pond water with just their hands. And it's no biggie um, when we do pond water experiments. Anyways, if you don't know, again, if you don't know where it goes, if you're not sure if it goes in sharps or if it goes in bio trash or regular trash, don't just pick one. Ask me and I'll be happy to tell you guys. And I'll also probably explain it, unfortunately for you. All right, if there's an accident in the lab, accidents of any kind need to be reported to me um, immediately, preferably. You, you spill something, you break something, um, you drop your test tube just completely on the ground. It happens. People just aren't holding it um, well, or the tap the caps to them are not firmly attached and people forget that. And so they'll the tube will just fall out of the bottom. And um, that happens. It's not a big deal. I don't ever get mad. This is not what this is about. It's not about tell me so I can be mad. It's about tell me so I can be sure that you're cleaning it up responsibly. And I'll help you too. Um, if it's a small cleanup, then I might tell you just what you need to be doing or remind you what you need to be doing to clean it up and trust that you can do it. Like if you spill your tube over, it's not a whole lot of liquid there, but it does have bacteria. Um, so I would tell you what you would need to do um, to clean that up, like wiping up the actual bacteria spill and where to put the paper towels and disinfecting and all of this. So FYI, um, spills or any accident of any kind 
you have to tell me about it. Just just be like, hey, oh, Professor Yost, I spilled my tube on accident. And I'll be like, okay, you, you know how to clean it up. And if you tell me yes, I'm assuming you're doing it correctly. Um, and if you're like, can you help? And I'll be happy to help. Just let me know is all. I'm not going to, you know, I'm assuming that you know what you do if you don't ask for help. Um, if you hide it, you will be in big trouble. I find it highly disrespectful um, if you were to have something happen where like there's a spill or broken glass or something like that. Um, I don't know that, I, you know, you just didn't tell me about because you were afraid you're going to get in trouble or something like that. Like you're more, way more likely to get in trouble if you don't tell me about it. Way more likely. If you tell me about it, I'm happy to help you. Um, really like this, just like, okay, let's solve the problem. If you don't tell me about it and you try to hide it, like this happens. So on the exam one time, I say one time, it happened twice um, in one semester, but um, uh, there's a tube that was liquid and somebody had picked it up at the exam and like tipped it and it like spilled out everywhere. And um, one of my students like just like left it there like that with the spill everywhere that other people were going to have to cycle through that station with bacteria, nasty all over the place and whatever, didn't even clean it up or whatever. Um, yeah, if you do that and you don't even, even clean it up, um, <laughs> we got a problem, right? So, um, just, just tell me about it and I'll clean it up. It's not a big deal. Accidents happen. And I'd rather you tell me about it so I can know about it than you leave it and somebody get hurt or sick because of your, um, inaction. Right. So, um, if you break glass, I will either come help you clean it up or make sure you know how to clean it up safely um, so that nobody gets hurt, nobody cuts themselves and all that. And we'll make sure that we get all the pieces of glass. Sometimes the glass will go quite a ways away from where you break it, right? So we want to be sure we get all of the pieces. I'll help you with that, right? It's another reason why you want to tell me so that I can help you fix that. Um, accidents with injury. Let's say you broke your tube and um, you also cut your hand in the meantime because you tried to grab it just instinctively or something. Um, you would wash, you know, well, we go through everything you're supposed to do, obviously washing your hands and all this. Um, and I have bandits. I have a first aid kit up at my desk in that area. I say desk, wherever that area is that I sit at the front. Um, uh, yeah. So anytime that anybody's hurt, basically just tell me, um, and we'll take care of it the best we can. If there's some serious injury, I don't know how you managed it, but if you did get some serious injury, then you'd be sure you let somebody know immediately so we can get 911 or something like that going. Um, general safety, uh, aseptic technique isn't just for keeping your culture sterile. It's also for your safety. So, um, we'll learn the details of kind of what aseptic technique is in the next, um, talk that we have. It's literally about aseptic technique and isolation. So, um, you know, when you have a mixture of different kinds of bacteria and you just want to get one kind to study how you would get that one. So that's isolation. So um, aseptic technique is referring to making sure when you're handling your culture. So if this is your culture, uh, you don't want the outside getting into your culture, but you also don't want your culture getting to the outside, right? So everything's in its place and not contaminating one another. That's what aseptic technique is really about. It's just about preventing contamination. Um, so always think of things that way, keeping your bench top clean is part of that, right? Um, whatever. So uh, washing your hands before you leave lab, or at least using hand sanitizer is important uh, because we are dealing with live bacteria and they will have gotten somewhere or somehow. So wash your hands. Don't bring it home. Um, do not drink the ethanol. I wish that I didn't have to say this, but apparently I do. The alcohol that we use in lab is ethanol. That is drinking alcohol, right? So that's what just the chemical term for it. All of our um, alcohol, our ethanol has it just a touch of methanol in it so that we don't have to have a liquor license because um, if it was just pure uh, ethanol and water then you would be able to drink it safely and we would need a liquor license according to the state of Oklahoma so um so that we don't have to we have methanol in there it's just the, a kind that you can buy um and methanol can make you go blind so please do not drink the alcohol in the lab okay all righty um Never operate Bunsen burners without an instructor present, kind of self-explanatory. Um, if there's some sort of immediate emergency, I'm not gonna make you turn them off, be responsible. Um, and I'm not gonna leave you on the first day with the Bunsen burners, right? So just, you know, 
be responsible adults. If you are on immunosuppressants or have an immune disorder, please let me know. Um, this is an immediate emergency type of thing, but if you are taking Humira or if you have some sort of um, immune disorder, um, like so, I don't, I mean, I don't know what, but um, but yeah, if you have, if for any reason you are immunocompromised, or if you are pregnant, that is making you immunocompromised. That's another way to be immunocompromised, by the way. Um, you're more likely to get sick when you're pregnant, yeah? So if you're more likely likely to get sick than the average population for some reason, just let me know. Shoot me an email or talk to me about it. Be sure you check with your doctor and make sure that it is safe for you to be taking this course. They are non-pathogenic strains, like I said, but still, if you um, maybe your doctor doesn't want you to risk it, you want to check with that before you start coming to class, right? And make sure that I'm aware of it so we can, you know, maybe get you some gloves or something. Right. Again, reiterating, if you have any questions at any time, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to call you. You don't have any business being in this class or going to nursing school if you can't ask for help, seriously. So it's going to be a whole lot of um, asking questions uh, when you first get into that um, or whatever field that you're going in, honestly, especially if it's any medically related stuff, just you're going to have to ask for help. So get get used to that. Um. Yeah. And I am somebody who believes that if you have the courage to ask a question, yeah, it always makes all of us nervous. If you have to go ask somebody who knows better a question about something that you did wrong, that you know, you did wrong. Um, of course that's normal. And that that's fine. If you can get over that anxiety and come ask me a question still. Yeah. I'm going to have more respect for you, not less. <laughs> okay. So that's great. So be sure you ask questions if you need. Um, and if you ask, I will come and help you. Um, if you don't ask, I won't. So sometimes it's because I don't know that you need help. Sometimes it's because I'm seeing that you are just not, um, being, having the courage that you need to, um, to get through it. So, so yeah, so be aware of that. So after we get done with this lecture, so we're moving on to the ubiquity of microbes next, by the way, after we get done with this, go ahead and watch the, um, lab safety video. It's just me going through the lab and showing you how to be safe and talking about the same old stuff. Maybe put it on double speed or something and watch it and make sure that you've seen it. Please be sure that you watch it. All right. So moving on to the ubiquity of microbes. Do any of you guys have any questions about the lab safety stuff? Again, we'll probably go through some of it again when we get into lab, right? So, all right. Ubiquity again means that they're everywhere. Um, microbiology in general, it's not just about pathogens. Uh, that's the cooler part. Um, so one of the things that I didn't talk about the last time, um, I have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. Uh, so I'm not Dr. Yost. I'm Professor Yost or Lauren, or I don't even care. So, um, but if you call me doctor, I'm not going to slap you or something either. So, uh, I was working on a PhD at my, um, graduate school. I went to the university of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. It is, um, it's not a state school. It is actually a private school. It's actually an Ivy league school. I get to brag about that. So, <laughs> so I do a little bit, but I was doing very well. Um, I was collaborating on research with the CDC and with the army. I mean, I was, I was very successful at it and I was doing quite well and I really liked it. Um, and I got married and um, my husband, I'd, I'd gotten us a, an apartment in Cherry Hill, which is across, it's in New Jersey, across the river. And um, had put a down payment on it and was getting ready to move in after the wedding and my husband's just like, yeah, I'm not moving to Philadelphia. And I was like, wait, why? And he's like, because my my dream, I'm trying to follow my dreams in my career. And my dream has me at Tinker Air Force Base in Midwest City, Oklahoma. And so I said, oh, okay, great. And um, packed up everything that I had, basically. I mean, it's a long story short, but uh, I moved to Oklahoma for him. Um, I am not married to him anymore, just FYI. I'm married to somebody else now. <laughs> um, so don't do that for anybody. I oh, mean, I was so successful and he had me give that up for his job. What is that? So anyways, that's why I have a master's degree. I was doing quite well. Um, and then I never finished my PhD, but, um, I studied cell molecular biology, but I focused on viruses and viral like diseases and primarily the hemorrhagic fevers. So I worked with Ebola um, Rift Valley fever virus. And my focus was on Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, which is tick-borne um, and whatever. So they were dangerous diseases, the ones you have to go BSL-4, which we'll talk about in the next lab, what that is. But um, anyways, that's what I did. So I worked with that at the research level. 
And then um, when I came to Oklahoma, I mostly did industry stuff. So I worked with OBI as a phlebotomist. And <laughs> um, I did that for three years. I actually really liked it. And then I moved to DLO and I did lab stuff, lab testing in um, Southwest. And then um, Integris, if you guys didn't know, um, Integris owns 49% uh, of DLO. The other 51% is Quest Diagnostics. Um, so that's why DLO is in all of the Integris hospitals because they are, do all of the lab work for Integris. Um, but yeah, and then I did within DLO, I did um, transplant testing. So I did all the tr transplant testing for transplant patients, getting kidneys and stuff like that. And that was the most stressful job I've ever had in my life. Getting called in at 3 a.m. to test to see if somebody was going to be a match with this deceased donor whose kidney is waiting. And um, this this patient is waiting and the surgeon is waiting for your results for this four-hour test. And you're given very limited resources. And it's just you by yourself. So that was a little too much for me. Um, and then COVID happened. And then I went and worked for food testing. Um, and now I'm here because the food testing thing was a lot of work. Um, but you'll hear me talk about the, these things in context every now and then. So that's why I'm mentioning it now. Um, and because I know quite a lot about the pathogens and that's the things that I'm more interested in and who wouldn't be, but there are other ones. Okay. So we will have to mention them sometimes too. Sorry. Pathogens are just disease causing microbes. So if it causes a disease, it's a pathogen. Um, there are microbes pretty much everywhere. Um, on and in living beings. We know that. We know about our gut biome. And um, you know that there's not just a biome in your gut, right? You know, there's a biome on your skin, um, maybe in your mouth, um, in your nasal area. There's just, there are bacteria all over you, man. I hate to break it to you. Um, soil, water, and the air. So yes, yeah, the air. Think about that. So, all right, and the living beings. We're not gonna go through all of these. I'm going to point something out here. Um, if I look through this list, Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus mutans, Propionibacterium acnes, Staphylococcus aureus, Helicobacter, uh, Helicobacter pylori, Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Candida albicans, Candida auris, Neisseria meningitidis, and Clostridium difficile. All right. That's a lot of words. I don't expect you to spit them out like I just did. I do this for a living. So of course I can say it like that, but all of these can be part of your normal biome somewhere in your body. All of these can also cause very significant disease within human bodies. Just to, just to point out a few that maybe you are familiar with, we'll get to know all of these, believe me. Um, and more Clostridium difficile. You would know this more fondly as C. diff. It causes something called pseudomembranous colitis. It's quite severe colitis, so inflammation of the colon associated with this infection. It's usually caused by taking antibiotics and your bacteria in your GI tract get cleared out. So think of it as a stadium, right? And there's all of these bacteria, different bacteria from of all different sorts doing all sorts of different stuff for your gut and making you, breaking stuff down for you and doing healthy stuff for you, right? There's maybe a few of these guys in there just sitting in the stadium seats. You take an antibiotic for your knee surgery and knock out all of those good guys in those stadium seats. But this guy often survives because he's an endospore making bacteria, which means it's hardy. It's going to survive things that other ones might not. And then what happens? All the stadium seats are empty. So it goes crazy and overgrows the whole thing. And now you have C. diff proper um, and pseudomembranous colitis that it produces. So that's how that works. There's normal bacteria in your body. This other one right above it, Neisseria meningitidis. I'm sure you can guess what that would cause. Meningitis, right? So this is the meningitis, bacterial meningitis. We're not gonna go through all of them, I promise. Um, that's associated with getting the rash, right? So if you have meningitis um, symptoms, which is the stiff, sore neck, sensitivity to light and a fever, um, and there are others too, of course, but, um, maybe fatigue and stuff, but if you have a rash associated with that, it's almost always going to be Neisseria meningitidis. You don't have a rash with your meningitis. The most common cause of your meningitis will be Streptococcus pneumoniae. 
Neisseria meningitis, I'm telling you, is about the absolute most dangerous meningitis that you can have. It's very dangerous. Um, it can live naturally in like your sinuses and stuff. How are you going to sleep tonight, y'all? How are you going to sleep tonight? So uh, I'll show you guys know some of these like staph, Staphylococcus aureus, right? Um, but these are normal to find within the human body. Not everybody has all of them, um, but yeah. All right, um, then moving on to the soil. Uh, plants will rely on bacteria to turn nitrogen in uh, the soil into a form they can use. And that's actually pretty important as far as when you're talking about like nutrition for us, because we're going to be eating the plants, right? So we need the bacteria to turn the nitrogen into usable stuff for the plants. And then we can eat the plants and get nitrogen from them. Why do you need nitrogen? If you took chemistry ever, then you probably learned about DNA. It has nitrogen, has nitrogenous bases. And you probably learned about protein made of amino acids. Amino is the group NH2. N is the nitrogen, right? So super important in the structures of your cells. You probably think of DNA as being really probably the most important, but you're absolutely wrong. It's the protein protein pretty much just is your cells and no it's not every bit of your structure of your cells but it pretty much dictates everything and how it is put there how did the cell membrane get there what put that there it doesn't just exist something had to do that enzymes and other proteins help build that stuff so that's why protein is so important all of the genes in your um, genome if they aren't um, telling your other genes what to do or they aren't doing something that we have no idea what it means. Um, so if it's not controlling the other genes somehow, it's coding for a protein. That's the only thing that your genes code for is protein. That's the only thing. So yeah, protein. Okay. And either way, whether it's your genes or the protein that they code for, nitrogen, you need it. One of the most essential nutrients, right? Just to put it in perspective, remind you guys, I told you we were going to talk about chemistry. Um, Oof. Yeah, this is, well, we're almost, we're almost there. All right. Anyways, there's some bacteria that live in the soil. <laughs> these are very common. Just they live in the soil. Isn't that cool? Some cool things about the, these guys here commonly used as um, prebiotics or, or pro, sorry, excuse me, probiotics. Prebiotics are like fiber and stuff that the bacteria can eat. Probiotics are the actual bacteria. So FYI, but um, you take probiotic bacteria um, to help out with your digestion. These are very common ones to see in those. Other things that you can see in the soil are these guys over here, Bacillus anthracis, Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium perfringens, Bacillus cereus, Mycobacterium leprae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Leptospira interrogans, um, Toxoplasma gondii, um, Enterobius vermicularis, and Coccidioides imidis. These are very commonly found in the soil, just chilling, not everywhere, but again, you know, just chilling. They're not uncommon, right? Anthrax, tetanus, botulism, gas gangrene, uh, food poisoning, leprosy, just causes um, a lot of different infections of the skin, uh, just in general, and nails and stuff like that. It's bacteria. Um, this is a potentially deadly disease transmitted by urine in animals. Um, people actually vaccinate their pets, especially dogs for this, um, it's lepto. Um, but people can get it too and can die from the brain associated disease that it can cause. Um, toxoplasmosis is transmitted within kitty litter and other just wildcats can have it. So it's going to be in the ground. Enterobius vermicularis, that's pinworms. If you don't know what pinworms are, this is whenever the little kids get an itchy bottom, they scratch it with their nails. Um, they can get little worms underneath or the eggs underneath their nails and then transmit it to themselves again or to other children because kids are very clean, aren't they? Um, but yes, it's pinworms. It's where you put the tape on your kid's booty um, to check to see if they have worms. We have this in the United States, not uncommon. And then coccidioides imidis is a fungus that causes a, fun a fungal meningitis potentially. It's not super common to get it that way. Um, but yeah, they also call it um, valley fever, but we don't have it in Oklahoma, but it can be found in the soil. Um, in other places. So sometimes pathogens, sometimes we have not pathogens. So them can be just normal. All right. In the water we have, um, in the marine, we can have anything, pretty much anything Vibrio, but especially these guys, um, Vulnificus and 
wow, let's try this one. Parahemolyticus. These guys are going to be associated with uh, cholera-like disease. So a lot of watery diarrhea, um, especially usually with eating like oysters that are uncooked. Okay. A certain time of year, the warmer the water, the more likely you're going to see this associated with it. In the freshwater, we have Giardia. Um, Nigleria phalari is one that causes the brain eating amoeba. Extremely deadly, by the way. Um, only a 2% survival rate, even with treatment. Um, cryptosporidium, it's like diarrhea causing um, protozoan in the water. Pretty common to see it in swimming pools because it's resistant to chlorine. Um, Entamoeba histolytica and schistosoma mansoni. These are all um, on the multi, like kind of multicellular end of things, not entamoeba, but um, these are eukaryotes. We'll learn what that is later. That's a chapter five thing, but um, eukaryotes um, have true nuclei and all the structures in the cell like mitochondria and stuff. But yeah, those are those. Uh, water treatment. The reason that we treat our water in general is the risk for cholera, E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, Hep A, and um, Tinea psyllium is tapeworms. So, you know, scary. Obviously, with um, global warming, like I said, well, the more that water gets, the more likely you're going to see infections associated with those bacteria in the water, including the brain-eating amoebas, by the way. And if you don't believe that global warming is a thing, you are pretty much behind the times. It's been more than than proven if you look at um, trends that we have, in fact, started trending warmer. And it's unavoidable at this point. Um, we might be able to go a little bit back down, but for now, during our lifetimes, it will be in that end of things. So we're dealing with the consequences of that right now. Um, moving on to the air, many labs and hospitals um, we'll test colony forming units. So that just means like the cells that are able to form colonies, which is from one cell growing and creating those little spots on the plates. Um, they'll determine how many bacteria basically are in the air. They want to see if their HEPA filter is working. They want to make sure they're keeping areas clear. Because if you're coughing and spreading stuff, this stuff can float in the air for, and I'm not kidding, months. Mm -hmm. Months, not all it, right? But some of it can actually float in the air for months. Um, it's just light and it doesn't need to be going anywhere anytime soon. So it can just chill on the currents of the air. So microbes don't flourish in the air. They don't grow there. There's no, not nutrients and it's a harsh place to be if you're trying to grow, but they can float in the air for quite some time and get transported places for quite some time. So um, they can be introduced by coughing, sneezing, excavation, construction, cleaning, aerosolized, liquids, droplets, disturbance of dust and dried particles, um, air conditioners, vents, and the wind. Any of this that can move the wind, then it can move microbes, right? Um, common airborne pathogens, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV. Those are completely different diseases that we're talking about. We're talking about COVID on the left and SARS on the right. Those are different. They are, okay? Don't confuse them. Not in this class. All right, um, and then we have mycobacterium tuberculosis. If you think that we don't have tuberculosis in the United States, you are kidding yourself. Uh, about a third of the world is infected with tuberculosis. Um, we have it in, in the United States, of course, mostly in the homeless populations. We did have an outbreak at an Edmond High School recently, 15 people, 14, something like that, were found to be positive, um, just carrying tuberculosis. You never know. Um, Influenza, you know what it is. Rhinovirus, cold. Adenovirus, cold. Um, Bordetella pertussis, pertussis or whooping cough. That's what that is. Okay, you get um, vaccinated for that. The uh, the DTaP or um, Tdap or whatever you want to call it, vaccine, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis. All right. Um, we'll talk about media a little bit more later on in the course, but just so that we can get started. Media, um, singular medium, is liquid, semi-solid, or solid that we can use to grow microbes on. Plates, broth, slants, and butts, um, they have to be sterile so that if they weren't sterile, then you could be growing something that you didn't even introduce in there. So it's throwing off your whole experiment. So it needs to be sterile whenever you're using it. No contaminants on there. And you have to handle it in a way to keep contaminants out. That's called aseptic technique, right? Next uh, lab, we will discuss aseptic technique. 
um, and how to transfer samples to and from that media. But what is media really? And how is it made? We have a video. Uh, if I can click on it, I cannot. Hold on. Sometimes if I hold control, this one won't. I hate this, that it doesn't let me do this. It's not here because it worked at home, I promise you. Interesting. Well, whatever. It's not that important. I was just going to talk about how to make um, culture plates. Uh, basically, it's just taking some nutrients and mixing them in with some auger. Auger is uh, stuff from um, algae to give solid aspect to your media. And it would look like this when you pour it out um, as a liquid, and then it would be hot liquid like that. You have your solidifying agent and your nutrients, and you've autoclaved it. Remember we talked about that, the steam, the heat, and the pressure, and then it looks sort of like a pressure cooker. And um, that allows you to sterilize it, and then it gets out. You cool it to cool enough that it won't melt the plates, and then you pour it into the plates and let them cool, usually covered, um, so that they can stay sterile. Um, and then once they're solid, you would be able to use them for stuff. Okay, so that's the gist of that. I wonder if I, um, no, okay, forget it. So what we would have done today, sterile swabs, just cotton, like cotton swabs, like you would do it in your ears. Um, so we would take sterile ones and we would do like maybe the keyboard in the lab or like your countertops or the bottoms of your shoes. I tend to not swab people's parts because that can become infectious pretty quickly. So we don't do that, but you know, error on the side of investigation as opposed to trying to get everybody sick. Um, so then we would take those swabs and put them onto those solid surface. If we imagine this being solid, right? It's just a solid surface. Um, take that cotton swab and just swab it all over that surface and then see what we can look at we won't know what it is right at face value but it might be cool to see the different things that pop up that's what we were going to be doing today um so after you streak it we would place it in an incubator it looks like a refrigerator exactly like a refrigerator but it's warm um everybody calls it a fridge don't call it a fridge it's not a refrigerator it's an incubator refrigerators keep things cold right um so i will get confused if you ask me to put something in a refrigerator i will not in the incubator so be careful um, but yeah, it keeps things at 33 degrees Celsius or about 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, sometimes in the summer, I'll turn that up to about 37 degrees Celsius. So the, the things will grow a little bit faster. Normally we have every other day. So we like it to go a little slower, but not during summer. So 37 is body temperature. Um, all right. So always come prepared. Um, having done your pre-lab, which you can't have access to. Uh, wearing a lab coat and wearing closed-toed shoes always inform me of any um, accidents of any kind. Dispose of waste properly, um, regular trash, bio trash, or sharps container, depending on what it is. Disinfect your bench tops when entering and leaving the laboratory and washing your hands when you're leaving. Um, ask questions if you have them. Microbes can be found almost anywhere. Not all microbes are pathogens, and sometimes they're not pathogens all the time. Um, some microbes can be pathogens or just part of your normal biota, like we learned. Uh, and then media is used to grow microbes for investigation purposes. And this is the general gist of that. Um, so for our comprehension comprehension of what I just talked about, we're going to go over some questions. Um, you don't have to turn anything in for this. This is just for um, say our discussion purposes. I'm going to kind of talk through it. Uh, but I want you to think through it on your own, okay? I hate it, uh, Zoom meetings, because most people at this point are already used to not doing the Zoom meetings and they don't want to talk. So it's uh, it's fine. I'm not going to make you. Um, I'll do the talking for you. I'm obviously prepared for that. So uh, where would your paper towels um, that you used to wipe your disinfectant on your bench before your lab, before the lab, get thrown away? It was a weird wording, but you got paper towels, you cleaned your bench top, where are you going to throw those away? So those, because they didn't get directly contaminated with bacteria that we know of, regular trash, right? So why should Betty be turned away for showing up to lab in strappy sandals? I don't just mean it's the rule, right? Obviously, yes. Okay. It's lab rule. She broke it and she shouldn't be allowed. 
That's not what I'm talking about. Why is it though? Why is that a problem? So if you think about it, it just puts her at more danger of getting an injury or getting exposed to contamination in a dangerous way. Um, so just, or taking it home with her too, right? Um, Jordan dropped a test tube and cleaned everything up carefully, correctly, and without incident. But did he, but he didn't tell the instructor. Why is that a problem? Well, even if he thought that he cleaned it up correctly, there could be bits of glass that he didn't see that somebody else could then step on or injure themselves on or slip on, um, something like that. Or if he didn't get all the liquid, somebody could slip on it or whatever. Just let me know so I can be sure that, um, you know, you're confident that you're actually cleaning it up right. I'll help you if you need it. It's not a big deal. Um, at a microbial level, what could be a problem with plastic pollution in our oceans? All right, so this one's coming out of left field. Right? <laughs> um, plastic pollution. Basically, we're talking about water bottles. Um, anything that is plastic that you throw in the trash can end up in the ocean eventually. And it kind of floats on the surface. And just like you can imagine, like a bunch of junky stuff floating on the surface of it, of any sort of body of water, is, stuff grows on it. And it uses it as like an island to attach itself to. Um, and that can even encourage the clumping together of more plastic. There's a there's an island the size of Texas in the Indian Ocean made of plastic. Um, anyways, so the microbes can grow there and in large amounts where they shouldn't usually be. Um, they can blot out the sun for organisms that are well beneath it. So then they're not getting sunlight that they should and that changes their biome. So it can have drastic effects on the area. Um, where do pathogens come from physically? Well, we learned that they could be on people's bodies or in people's bodies. They could be in the air, soil, water. They could come from pretty much anywhere. Um, they had to come from somewhere though, right? And then um, why can't microbes actually thrive in the air? There's no nutrients there. Um, it's just not, it's a kind of a harsh environment. So they can't stay there and most of them, you know, gravity. Just saying, eventually they'll fall. Uh, which would you expect to have more growth, a swab on the bottom of your shoe or a swab on a typical public toilet seat and why? What you think about that just for a second? We'll come back to it. But here on this next page, I'll have the answers and I'll post all this for you guys' reference later if you need it. If you don't, that's fine. I'm not making you look at it again, but um, it will be there. Okay. Um, so there's all of our answers, uh, for that last question for the bottom of your shoe versus the toilet seat. It's almost, yeah, almost in, indefinitely going to be the shoe. Uh, people clean in public toilets, clean toilet seats pretty regularly, several times a day, right? How often are you clean in the bottom of your shoe? How often are you walking into bathrooms with the bottom of your shoe and then not cleaning it afterwards? Um, I don't know about you. I don't know what you're doing on a public toilet, but for the most part on public toilets, um, when you're sitting down, you're not sitting down with your booty hole, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> or your mucous membranes touching it. Typically, you're just sitting down with the skin of your booty and it just doesn't have as many microbes on it as you're trying to think it does. So it turns out, and not to mention toilet seats are hard. So it's not very conducive to microbes kind of hiding out in little crevices and everything like that. So the shoes, man, hands down, I hate to break it to you. Um, and that's what you're carrying back into your homes. So I'll see you guys. <laughs> That's the end of this. Please watch the lab safety video if you at some point before the lab. It doesn't have to be today, but at some point before the lab. Um, you say you have a little while. Uh, the rest of this week is going to be on Zoom, and I'll send out reminder on um, Canvas. Uh, but whatever. Uh, it's going to be this rest of this week. There's just no way I could get anything done before the end of the week. I don't think that the second floor is even open yet. So I'll let you know. Now let you know, <laughs> I did get an email just now from Top Hat. I haven't read it, but um, I'll let you know about how that's going too. So I'll keep you guys in the loop. So it's that. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, Professor Yost, on the course materials, the little red, the the red book, that's for the lab though, right? Or the little, what says like modules on it? What is the red book for? Um... Mine is completely different from yours. So I have no idea. <laughs> Mine oh. just has like a bundle for the whole course. Um, and it just shows me this is what your students would be buying course material, $98 for everything needed in the course. 
So that's mm -hmm. all I see. I don't see like that individual thing. It says like microbiology relevancy modules release seventh edition. It just says McGraw Hill, but the actual I see the actual book like this red book is attached to it. So okay, well I guess I just won't. The read red it. book. The red book says relevancy modules. Yes, ma'am. So that's a McGraw Hill feature. Um, that is going to be stuff that is related to microbiology as you're going through the course, like they're like supplementary materials. And so the other one is probably going to be the actual textbook from McGraw Hill. So we don't really need to use the module. The red Honestly, module. if you want, if you want my uh, um, opinion about it, unless I'll say this, um, the textbook is very useful because you can search for things in it, you know, um, while we're going through things and it helps at least it would help me if I was studying this stuff. Uh, as you're searching and understanding things, but you don't need it. Like, that's the thing is like, it's required for the course because like, if you just rely on my talks and stuff like this, um, there's probably words that I'm using or explaining and stuff like that, that you guys don't understand. You need somewhere to go to look it up. That's kind of what the McGraw-Hill textbook is for. It's a physical, like, a, it's not physical for you, I guess it's digital, but it's a digital way to go to a different source of that media with more explanation in different words. Um, for you guys to look up this stuff so it's kind of like a reference book right but it's not like we have homework out of that book does right. that make sense mm -hmm. so um but yeah so you can i guess what my point is that's a study tool um well i feel like an absolutely necessary one the reference materials or whatever it is what was it called again it's called microbiology relevancy okay. modules yeah, those relevancy modules, they're like um, things you can work through little problems that you can solve, kind of like homeworks, okay. uh, not required. And you guys will, um, anything that is required is going to be already in like the grade book or the assignments. There's not going to be anything else that's going to pop up out of nowhere. So it's already there. Okay. So no worries. Okay. Yeah. And eventually Top Hat will be <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? Cool. Okay. The um, next one, it's looking like it's going to be shorter. So these kind of intro stuff, they get kind of long and lengthy, but uh, the next one's probably going to be pretty short. So, uh, but yeah, that's it. I'm going to kick you guys out now. Um, if you don't have any more questions and I've got a class right after you guys, just FYI, it's the same thing. Do this <laughs> twice. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So I guess right. I'll see you guys later. All right. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Right, Yeah. Mm -hmm.